Wait, were you pregnant during development? And then by the time you made it, had you had your child? Or- no, so I gave birth three weeks after we um, finished shooting. I was huge. Well, my respect just broke through. I can't, I mean, that's really, that's really amazing to be doing something at this level of intensity and your first feature while pregnant. I mean, it's amazing. That's incredible. I'm so thrilled that we get to talk about your movie, which I had been waiting for for a long time. I think since I saw the announcement and then since I saw the first trailer, which was a sick trailer and I was like, hang on a minute, what? And I loved it. And I'm really thrilled that we get to chat about it because I'm very inspired. It's every guy's worst nightmare getting accused like that. Really? Can you guess what every woman's worst nightmare is? Oh, well, likewise, I just thought Booksmart was just amazing 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 i just loved it so much oh it just made me think that i just wish there were more movies about female friendship like that that felt kind of properly real and actually i guess kind of in a funny way these two films are kind of twisted sisters absolutely i was thinking that we must have been in love with the same movies growing up i mean clearly there's like a a strong clueless like amy heckerling brain sisterhood here no 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 not acceptable this is not okay who will you to be this beautiful who allowed you to be this beautiful who allowed you to take my breath away the kind of visceral emotional connection to the psyche of a young woman like that real kind of like emotional empathy was so clear and i that's something that i'm always so eager for it's like can we please see a story of a woman that empathizes on a real level and isn't just sort of glorifying her as a perfect woman or tearing her down, of course. But I also felt like you must've been very inspired by To Die For, which is another one of my favorite, favorite, favorite movies. So I was like, yes, I love this woman. Um, It was very much a very big part of the mood board. Yes, the mood board must've been beautiful. I hope it's framed everywhere in your home. It must've been kick-ass. It was quite relentless. It was like a thousand pages long and people were very much, by the time I think of the end, they were like, oh, we really, we get it. You we seem to be really high. We get it. <laughs> and you- <laughs> That's how I, mine are always way too long. You are so pretty. I am a nice guy. Are you? And I wanted to start by just asking how you pitched this and like what the development process was and the pitching process and and all of that. I just want to know the whole story. I started pitching it about kind of sort of spring 2017 and I only ever really pitched the pre-title sequence so I would kind of do quite an in-depth sort of you know recreation I guess of that and so and it was so interesting the response because at the at the time the sort of first round of pitching it was very much pitching to men and it was just a really interesting thing to get the kind of immediate response because some of it was really wonderful. Some one guy, when I kind of pitched it to him, and I was like, and then she sits up and she's not drunk. And and he was like, wow, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. And then he was just kind of sitting, staring into space for a while. And I was like, <laughs> his worst. <laughs> and he said, Yeah, I'm just thinking about um, I'm just thinking about a couple of dates I've been on. I was like, how revealing amazing that's honest hey i said what are you doing and then one guy said oh i get it so she's a psycho and i was like okay. <gasps> that's incredible not for you my friend but then i had a short film i i wrote and directed a short film that went to sundance and then after that I think it made things a lot easier. And then also by then kind of Me Too had happened. And I think everyone felt, I certainly felt like there was a conscious effort for people to make stuff like this. But I pitched it to Lucky Chap and I just loved them immediately. And I'm sure you probably know those guys well. And they bought it off that pitch without knowing anything else about the movie. And then they just were incredible. There was no interfering. There was no, it was just only support. I was so, I was incredibly lucky. And they got it made in like 10 months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Which they sort of had to, to be fair, because I was incredibly pregnant. It's something, and I'm sure lots of women feel this way, it's something that you always feel incredibly nervous about because you think you're just going to be completely, you know, doomed. But actually in a funny way, 
for me, it meant we had this very specific time we could do it. So it sort of expedited things in a way, I think, you know, because, you know, they just go, they can go on and on. And also it weirdly gave me this, it's so uncomfortable. It's so bleak <laughs> that I was just like, okay, I just have to do it now. Yeah. And it yeah. kind of gave, I didn't, I was much less neurotic, I think, than I would have been. Cut. Check it. I'm just so interested in like, is the physicality of like running a set of being the director on a set do you find as a director you get home and you're still like full of adrenaline compared to acting work or are you just like I want to die I'm so tired I wonder if you feel the same way that directing is so much less exhausting than acting in in a certain way because acting the stopping and the starting is of course exhausting like it's just you're, you're revving up and your adrenaline goes up and you're performing and then you're waiting for two hours and that walk back to the trailer and sitting there on your phone and like wondering if you should have learned how to knit and the whole process of like taking your focus out and thinking of other things and reading other books and then being like oh right this character I find that totally just exhausting in a way that makes me feel brain dead at the end of the day. And the, I think it's that the the boredom creeps in and sort of plants a seed and stays there and, and you're fighting against it to stay focused. Whereas with directing, because it is constant, I find that quite energizing. So it's like the relentless asking and answering of questions leaves you buzzing. And then of course you face plan when you get home, but it's a different kind of exhaustion. It's, I feel like it's almost like, after physical exertion and then you're then you're wrecked but it's not this kind of wave of desperately trying to stay focused which I think can happen as an actor on a set no matter how well organized the set is it's impossible to avoid those dips that's one of the reasons that I really prefer directing is because I think that there's this like the constant hum of intensity and energy actually kind of lights me up and do you think also because uh, I also think that that exhaustion I suppose when you're acting, particularly as you do in kind of huge sort of Hollywood movies, I, I imagine it's also kind of an emotional exhaustion because actually it's a completely different type of pressure and one that you're, like if you're directing something, you know, and something fucks up on the day, it fucks up, that's it. But it's not that feeling of like going home and being like, am I gonna be fired? Right. Is there like, are there people in an office somewhere watching this? Like, to be fair, I still live with that fear as a director. <laughs> like they could still do it. You're like, that's true. Don't know. too late to fire me? Mm, how pregnant are they with me? Would it be yeah, exactly. with me now? <laughs> the fear is a healthy fear, I think. Never goes away. Speed. Hey, Mark. I think that, you know, the pivot for me to directing has made me just admire and love actors in an even deeper way. And I suppose it's probably because I'm no longer feeling that level of insecurity or competition. You're not threatened by them anymore because it's no longer kind of, Ooh, I hope, I hope. And there's only like three roles for us this year. And so I hope everyone else gets pregnant. You know, it's like that kind of thing. <laughs> but now it feels like I, when you remove that ego from it and that insecurity and that com competitive energy, you're just left with the admiration of like, wow, actors are incredibly brave and giving. And, and so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was gonna ask you about your relationship with Carrie as you made the film, because I imagine you must've become so close and that feeling of um, just intense kind of gratitude that someone is, bringing the story to life and putting themselves out there on the level that she did, which was remarkable. Yeah, she, I mean, she's just so amazing. And I think the thing that I loved it, because I didn't know her before, you know, I, we just, I sent her the script and I hoped she would do it. It worked because we both immediately understood each other, got what the other person was saying and just got on so well. And it, I think it would have been impossible with anyone else. I think it needed somebody who was just like, yep, yeah, I'm there. I'm ready. And also, you know, apart from anything else, is she's an amazing person. Yes. She's a pro. She's on set all the time. She's ready immediately. You know, she's it, basically, she's on set ready to go anytime. She plays in this movie, spoiler alert, there's a, <laughs> there's a part in this movie that she definitely didn't need to be present for, and she was for a day, because she's just in it. She's like a She's, she loves doing it. She finds it pleasurable. Of course, she, there are the things that I think all actors feel, which is occasionally she feels like she hasn't hit the thing she wanted to do, which she always had, of course, because she's genius. But 
but she's such a pleasure to be around, which makes everyone else's job so easy because you're not talking anyone down. You're not like waiting every morning to see what kind of mood someone's going to be in. You're not dealing with any of that stuff. You're just dealing with somebody who loves their job and who loved and who really respects everyone else. You know, she was there being so giving and adorable and supportive. You know, these guys coming in having to like, you know, do some really dark shit and she's just delightful. She understood it was harder for them. Incredible actresses who can pull that off just always blow my mind. Like Florence Pugh is the star of our film right now and she's the same and it just is remarkable to watch. And I think, you know, it's something that you have, we've all read about from the greats, everybody from Meryl to, you know, um, Kristen Scott Thomas to like all these incredible actresses who have the ability to just like bang, turn it on. I remember hearing, and I think it's like a lot of English actresses actually, cause like Claire Foy is like that. And I, I think it's, it's something that is suggestive of a lack of ego in the process that I think as a director, you're just so grateful for. And when you hear these stories of actors who are less giving or maybe need to be more of a solo act in every single way, it's kind of terrifying. And it's like, we know at some point in our directing careers, we'll have to yes. contend I know. with that. And it's like, oh, I think we've both been spoiled to this point. It's like, we've had lots of lovely people. But I think, cause I read, um, I read that you have a no assholes policy. Yes. Yeah, and it's something that really we definitely try, I, I, I hope succeeded with actually, everyone was so lovely on our movie, but I was so interested when I read that from, from you, because I sort of thought, I wonder if that is a sort of particularly female thing. And I don't, I, you know, I don't generally like gendering things, but I think we've all felt that thing, I think of feeling like nobody can give a fuck if we're comfortable. And so certainly for me, I just couldn't bear the idea of anyone coming in and feeling like hostile environment. I just can't imagine like screaming in someone's face. Someone who's a very established um, actor and director in this industry um, gave me really terrible advice that was helpful because I just knew I had to do the opposite. And they said, listen, the way to get respect on a set, you have to have three arguments a day three arguments, big arguments that just reinstate your power, remind everyone who's in charge, be the predator. And I was like, that is the opposite of my process. And I want none of that. And, and I think that it is an unfortunate part of the kind of the paradigm as it is, it has it's been created over the last hundred years, the idea that great art has to come from a place of discomfort and anxiety and that the pressure cooker has to get to a point where it can be something intense and valuable in that way. And I do think it may be a uniquely female instinct to say like, look, we can be nurturing and we can multitask. And it doesn't mean that anyone needs to be uncomfortable. And it doesn't mean that I have to constantly remind you of my, my position, because I don't think anyone on a set has ever forgotten who's in charge. It's in fact, an incredibly hierarchical system. If anything, I think we'd all benefit to sort of remove the hero narrative from that structure and to acknowledge that a director is uh, a sum of all these parts that we have the opportunity to, to delegate to all these incredible people that we've asked to come on board. And I think we, we'd be better served to kind of lean into that, to remind everyone of the kind of cohesive collective process rather than constantly saying like, I'm in charge. I, I remember I worked for a director who felt I think very threatened that or or at least concerned that maybe as a woman men weren't listening and i think she felt quite anxious about it and wanted to kind of continue to uh sort of reinforce the idea that like i'm in charge i'm in charge and then felt actually worried that anyone questioning her meant that they were questioning her because she was a woman and so she felt she had to battle with them constantly and it, i felt for her because it was exhausting and i i think that if we enter this process as, as directors who are women, which one day we'll get rid of the female director title and just be directors. But if we all enter the process without thinking like, they're not gonna listen to me, it's a battle. If we just removed that and realize like, they're here, they want to work for me, they could have taken another job. And so it's actually my job to take care of them and to listen. Um, I just think the product would be better on the whole. 
this idea of having three arguments a day, there just comes a point where people, where do you, where do you differentiate between something that's really important right. and something that isn't? Like, I think that there are moments necessarily where like, you know, you do have to be sort of fairly sort of strict or straightforward or, you know, to just like get things back on the rails, whatever it is. And I think you're just in su- such a stronger position to do that yeah. if that's unusual. Like I, I can't, it's, it's, it's really funny and I agree completely with what you say. I think there's this sort of idea that being a kind of tormented artist is a sort of, you know, is a kind of the route to genius. But I, I really do think as I've sort of gotten older, I think increasingly it is just a mask for a lot of fear and anxiety. And it's kind of a sort of synonym for bullying. <laughs> Yes, it is. Like, oh, that person is a real, you know, they're just, they're a real artist. They're really, it, they go deep and you're like, I don't want it. They sound tough. They sound yeah. hard work, actually. And the no assholes policy, it's really, I think, you know, puts everybody on the same level. Because one thing that I also noticed as an actress for years was how the hierarchy of the set separated the actors from the crew in this very strange way that serves no one. I mean, the whole idea of like the talent Mm. and then the crew as though like they're just technicians and and then the actors are somehow separated and protected from all of the actual work, which makes them, I think, have uh, probably more insecurity because they don't understand, they're not given the chance to understand the process. And I think actors would actually like to know more about like, what what's happening there when you're pulling my focus and how's that and what is that lens change but the idea of well don't don't bother the actors and keep them separate and don't look at them and you know it's I think it makes everyone quite anxious um, and and sort of frightened of each other yeah I really do think trailers have a lot to answer for I agree and if it were if I were allowed I would just say hey everyone gets kind of a shitty trailer the exact same one everyone has to have lunch together you know yeah. unless like it, it just because as you say if you've got your own kind of like lovely jacuzzi and yeah. <laughs> wife, like you're not at what you're not with everyone really yeah, yeah. like and it is it makes it difficult to be collaborative and I think and also as you say it's like actually it's alienating it's lonely yeah. it's more it, fun to be with everyone I think yeah. really. and I think like then you have to be vulnerable in front of these people and you've been separated from them. And so now suddenly you're like, oh, I have to do this vulnerable thing. I mean, I always liken it to a, a, a film set often is like a construction site. And then you bring these people into this construction site. And then you say like, hold the work for moments. And everyone's just kind of like waiting for the acting to be done so you can go back to building the building. And it's like, the actors are like, I'm sorry that I'm acting. I'm so sorry. Oh, and it's like, if we just if we just restructured it so everyone was working together, I mean, much more like theater, I guess. Then that's why when you train in theater, you learn everyone's job and everyone knows what the whole process is. I think if we just stopped accepting that the paradigm we were handed in terms of filmmaking and the process that goes into it, if we just stopped accepting it and then we were allowed to rethink it and thought like, actually, there is no difference. Everyone is crew. Everyone can, everyone's on the same level. Everyone matters the same. It's very hard in COVID because you're actually literally separated into zones. <laughs> I'm so interested in this because I do, and I think it's all sort of part of the same thing, but like so much of making a film is the fun of it, is the camaraderie, is all of these things that you're describing. It's like knowing somebody coming in and saving somebody else's ass, somebody coming up with a bright idea that just means you can actually shoot the scene when it looked like it was hopeless. Like that stuff is just pleasure and the jokes and the you know the, the the whole thing of it is a pleasure and you know for some people the flirting you know whatever it is that they go to work the gossip the, the yeah. night of of a job of working with people and I I'm so interested in COVID because of course it just stops that so that so that trust that you're describing must be so hard to foster like did you guys at least start outside of COVID so you'd at least met properly? We did and we were able to have rehearsals outside kind of distance rehearsals where people could take masks off and be together and but it definitely affects that exact 
ingredient in the process, the camaraderie. It definitely makes it more difficult. And it's interesting because you have to really focus on everybody's eyes and like everyone is, is communicating so differently. And there's like a lot of gesticulating because everyone wants to be like, I'm here. I'm like, there's a lot of people trying to communicate like how much you can trust them just with their hands. And I think, you know, we've now been at it so long that everyone has formed this real family, but I definitely feel that my whole process on Booksmart was so uh, heavily focused on like creating a vibe because it was also young people. And, you know, it was a lot of just like music and food and everyone being able to kind of dance together in between takes and be together. And it, it actually made a huge difference. It was just like warming everyone up into a really good groove. And it has, that part is, is more difficult when everything is full of a little more anxiety and, and you have this separation. And I'm a very cuddly person too. So like my instinct at every moment is to be like, oh, to cuddle with everyone and like having to stop myself and being like, no, we are being responsible. That is, it, 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 it forces you to realize that when, you know, we have to kind of sink into a groove in a different way. And it's like, you're still trying to find that same rhythm because that's so much of what it's all about. And I think, you know, for your film, I felt the tone so consistently and you took so many bold choices with the tone as well. And without giving anything away, like there are, I mean, which is miraculous that in 2020, you were able to 2021, you were able to have a twist, like a really, truly shocking twist, a few of them, but like really shocking. It's so remarkable, but your tone remains consistent as you make these really bold choices. And that's so fucking hard to do. So I was really amazed by that. Thank you. Well, I think, but it, but it sounds like it's sort of a similar thing. It's sort of just, um, for me particularly as well, like sending stuff out. So not only did I send out the script, but I sent out like my Spotify playlist that had like Britney on it a thousand times and, you know, all of that stuff. And, and then the, the crazy mood board of a thousand pages, but just so that, because I think it was important for everyone because I knew what it read like, you know, it's, it's a really tough tone to explain on the page. So, so much of it for me was like, okay, for everyone who's gonna maybe be part of this movie, if they can kind of see this stuff, first and know what it's going to be and then they can kind of decide if they want to do it because lord knows we weren't really paying very much money it was it was like you know Bo kept on saying I'm doing, I'm doing this the for sad minimum, minimum. <laughs> <laughs> slut drop to Paris Hilton I was like yeah, yeah, yeah well do you want to go out with me what on a date Seriously, I just spat in your coffee. It's just kind of trying to find those like-minded people who really kind of get it and love it and are behind it. And then, and then actually I thought the tone was sort of okay because we all knew what it was gonna be, that it was, that we were kind of gonna slightly swing for the fences and not, I mean, there were moments because all of the Carrie and Bo scenes, the Ryan and Cassie scenes, most of them are steady cam to give it that kind of like loose sort of romantic and intimate feel. And the days we, I think we first shot them like two weeks in and I was like, why the fuck didn't we do this? <laughs> because of course it was really important to me and I'm glad we did it to do this incredibly kind of static formal compositions. But in terms of time, it just, you know, it, it kind of killed us. But, but it was amazing because working with all these incredible people, Michael Perry, who's the art director, you know, he did, he literally started on Sweet Valley High. Oh, wow. The, yeah, and he was the king of the kind of like subvertive feminine. And how was it for you? Because obviously you you guys were so close after Book Smart, I'm assuming, just because it felt like- close. I mean, seemingly close. I think everyone who saw us after the movie was just like, enough, we get it. Group hugs, group hugs. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I, value so much. I felt so close to directors that I worked for for years. Like I just, and I still call on them now. They're all my mentors and they're very patient with me as I ask them endless questions, but I really value that connection. I think that, you know, a good director asks you to like go there and then brings you back. And then that can form such a tight bond, but it takes such an intense communication. I mean, 
there isn't a couples therapist in the world who wouldn't be impressed by like the communication skills of a director and an actor when it's good because it's so much about listening and i think like when you describe you guys finding that tone that comes from you being a very good communicator and that is what the skill of a director really is it's like to be able to communicate a tone as complex as yours i was just thinking like wow she must be very very good at communicating, at describing. And it can be really hard. It can be hard because everyone brings their own um, baggage to everything, of course. And when people project, sometimes they can get it wrong. And it, it, it felt like a very personal film in a way that I kept recognizing things that I was like, oh, I get that. Oh, because that feels like it's from my um, adolescence. And like that feels, it was both personal and universal, I think is the best movies are but it must have come from a lot of communicating. And I think that's why the mood board must have been very, very helpful. Cause it's like when you can't describe it and you're like, like this, you have to be comfortable sounding like an idiot. Sometimes I think with the technical yeah. stuff, you have to be like, you know, the thing when it goes like, vroom, yeah. and you're like, I recognize that had <laughs> I gone to film school, I might've been able to describe that shot in a more- And the camera, way. it's camera, right? The thing <laughs> with the, it's, but that honestly, but I think that is such a huge thing. For, that was such a huge like learning curve for me. It was like, I think, and, th and this is just my, per my I've, I've got a real like know it all kind of like, you know, me, me, me sort of personality, like insufferable. And I think the thing for me that was hardest was having to be like, okay, I have to, no matter how much I want to pretend I know everything yeah. and just yeah. can't pretend. Fake it to make it is just like a route straight off a cliff. And as you say, I think that thing, having that freedom to be like, I do care deeply about this nail polish color. And I do care deeply about this kind of like reference. We're going to visual reference, whatever it is. But I do not know the name of that light. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm gonna be okay saying like the one, the the floating, the big one. Can we have the biggie, the big one, the brownie one? Why do you guys have to ruin everything? <laughs> there is still a little bit of extra scrutiny. Um, I, I was very lucky in that that didn't really happen, you know, for me so much. But like a friend of mine, who's British director, who's brilliant, she um, on her second movie just she just really she was like dropping. She was dropping scenes. She was just way behind on her schedule. She just couldn't understand it because she'd been so kind of diligent and it was really unlike her. And, and so the first weekend she went home and she thought about it and then she came back, uh, she came back to set on the Monday and she just banned the phrase, are you sure? And she got back two hours a day. Because what? what she found was not that people were being obstructive, not that they were being difficult. They just wanted to help but they kept suggesting other things. So she'd come and say, we're gonna do it like this, this. And somebody would say, you know, if we did it and she'd listen and go, okay, mm -hmm, well, I think we're still, and that was the thing. It was actually this kind of slightly, it wasn't people being dicks. They were being slightly paternalistic. They thought they were helping they, and protecting her, but they were wasting her time. And I thought that was just so, I was so interested in that just as a concept because I, and I'm, I'm sure it happens actually to lots of people but it was just so amazingly perceptive of her to notice that it was actually people helping that was hindering her. Right. Oh God, that makes so much sense to me. I think it's such a balance, right? Because you have to know when to stop and listen. Like I remember this really profoundly educational moment for me when I was working for Ron Howard on a movie and I just adore Ron and he's so good at delegating and he's very kind. And I watched him set up a, a scene and we blocked it and he set it up. And then the DP, who was a brilliant man, Anthony Dodd Mantle said, you know, Ron, if you do it from this other side, if we take the scene and flip it and do it on the other side of the room, it'll actually help us because of this, this, and this. And I watched because I thought I've worked for directors who would just like snap at that moment and say like, stop threatening my opinion here. And instead Ron said like, well, let's see it. And he allowed for it and he said, okay, between the two, I think I like this one better and made the call and we moved forward. And I just implanted it in my, my brain because I was like, okay, so you have to find the balance between what your friend wisely figured out with the ability to listen and to consider the fact that your idea might be wrong. And that balance is like the name of the game. It's not tricky. And 
and also you're not always going to get it right. I right. think that's the other thing. And like, you're not, sometimes you're going to be too under time pressure to really listen in the way that you would like to all the time, you know, and, and you might have to kind of make compromises there. Um, but yeah, but I think you're absolutely right in general. It's just, yeah, trying to be as egalitarian as you can, trying to accept that other people are there for a reason because they're amazing and they've got like, they're bringing their own genius to it. Um, but yeah, no, it is, it's, a, it's just such a delicate balance, I think, in something that as a very sort of repressed English woman. <laughs> <laughs> when you were describing hugging, I was like, no. <laughs> Carrie tried to hug me once and I was like, absolutely not. Exactly. <laughs> she's always she's always trying, but I'm just ba I'm basically like a never nude kind of um sort of unbelievably uptight misery guts. <laughs> but for me, you know, it was just so much of that was just like just letting letting go as well. We haven't broken any rules. Okay. We've broken a lot of rules. One. We have fake IDs. Fake college IDs so we can get into their 24-hour library. But I wanted to ask you about, so then doing a second movie. Right. When you're so close to everyone, it went so incredibly well. Obviously, you loved making it as much as everyone loved watching it. How terrifying is doing a second movie a prospect when that, or, or did you actually feel kind of more confident? I definitely felt more confident because the first time you're just like, okay, um, thank you everyone for taking this massive risk on me and I hope I don't humiliate you. And the second time you do feel like, okay, I know what I'm doing and you can all trust me and that you feel a little more proven. I think there's, you know, coupled with that is the total uttering, utterly crushing fear of, of sophomore slump of like, oh, the first one was a fluke and this is going to reveal my true lack of skill. You know, like that's just in your head and yet I, I so far feel like I have prevailed over the inevitable kind of insecurity and anxiety that comes from taking risks that you care about. I feel that, you know, if you remember that it is supposed to be um, an adventure and if you turn the nerves into adrenaline, I think it can be quite thrilling to do the second one because you feel like you're a little bit warmed up in a way that you think like, I'm gonna take more risks and I'm gonna have more fun with it. And then you, you, you've learned from, the value of the risks you took the last time and you think like, yeah, I can trust that that's my thing. You also start to learn that you have a thing, that you have a, a style. And that's kind of amazing because you, you just think like that, that can be something you get to know better and follow. And it's like a gut instinct you're learning about. So it's also, I think as an, being an actor for so long, you're like, so used to this weird circus life of like, here I am and this is my new family and my new reality and identity. And I think we're now very used to this concept of like, move on to a different set, start fresh, start anew. And it's almost like the movies become like mandalas. Like you just like wipe them away and start again. And I think on this one, it's so different from Booksmart in every way that it doesn't feel like I'm, um, kind of chasing anything. It feels like a completely new set of tools. And, a, and I, I feel the same kind of thrilling sense of like discovery. It's also when you have started later in life, like, you know, I, I directed my first movie at 34. And- Me you, too. Ah, that's great. And like having kids and directing movies and you're like, okay, there's something about that pivot later in life. Like, it's not like I went to film school, directed my first movie at 21, like so many brilliant directors. It, when it comes a little later, I think you're a little more efficient in terms of like, okay, if I only get to make five movies in my whole career, what movies do I want to make? And like, how can I be really clear about what they are? And then I think you, you approach them with a very clear set of intentions. I have this thing about like, why not write novels or make documentaries or tell mm -hmm. stories through theater or some other way? Like why make narrative feature films? And I always think it's gotta be because there's the ability with feature films to tell things in a less literal way and to be emotional about it and to take risks and to just use the medium and use the tools. And I so appreciated that you 
had fun with the tools at your disposal and you played with it and you, had, you, you, you direct from an emotional place that's incredibly creative and bold. And I so appreciated being taken on a journey. And I just think like, the only time I get frustrated watching a movie is I'm like, well, this could have been a documentary. <laughs> or it's like, it's just, if you're gonna make it as naturalistic as possible, I understand, but still like, still have fun with the tool, still have fun with it. Like, it doesn't have to be like, wide shot, close up, wide shot, close up, wide shot, close. like, you know, like we get into this thing of this is how it, there's, there is a directing by numbers pattern that I think people feel safe in. And I love that on your first fucking feature, you were like, no, everything is gonna come in a much more bold way. And I just thought it was so fucking cool. Thank you. But I just, I completely agree. I think that's why movies are so exciting is they are specific. They're a specific way of telling a story and also they're contained. TV is so amazing now. You can be so detailed, you can create huge worlds, but a film is, a, is so much about what you're not showing is what you're showing. And, and it's, you can be allegorical actually. And those are the kind of movies I love, like Night of the Hunter keeps kind of coming back in the movie. I'm like, leave it alone. Um, <laughs> but I can't because I love it so much, you know, and, and Killing of a Sacred Deer, which is another film I'm completely obsessed with because there are, these are movies that like are in no way naturalistic, but they hit you, they make you feel something it almost like kind of David Lynch does that you it's like somebody described David Lynch as having the logic of a dream in that you understand it but you can't put your finger on exactly if somebody says what happened you're like I don't know but yeah. I know but I kind of I could tell you how I feel and that's the sort of stuff I love I like knowing how I feel about something but not necessarily being able to articulate it and I think we've become it's really interesting we've become very the way that we view almost anything now but particularly movies tends to be like is it good is it bad or like is it morally right is it morally wrong these kind of these things but how did it make you feel like that's what I'm more interested in I think in like of course there are lots of movies that I don't like but I appreciate a good, I guess, you know, and that's fine. That's, it's important. And so certainly for me, I, I felt like movies about serious stuff or that I felt was very serious, um, never looked the way that I feel my life looked, you know, like yeah. the stuff in this film is the stuff of my life and of so many young women and some young men's lives and it's never treated seriously. Yes. It is important. That's the thing, you know, the, the how you choose to dress is a weapon. And, and, you know, and for me, it was always, again, I asked a lot of questions about the nails, which I'm always delighted to answer because I'm obsessed with nails. But, you know, it's because people don't expect you to scratch their eyes out if that's how you paint your nails. And so what, what an important, like, for me, it's like, if there's every detail of a film, the details that I think most people would overlook because they think that they're silly or they're shallow, those are opportunities to tell more story. And even if it's a little bit overblown, a little bit arch, you know, a little bit over the top sometimes, I'd rather that, I think, than just, as you say, kind of playing it safe. Uh, yeah. It's just not yeah. really, there's so much stuff out there right now that is so fucking good. That's <laughs> just like, in fact, I, I haven't even watched half of the stuff this year that's good because I just don't, I just like, there's too much. It's so. Yeah. So I think it's that thing of like, you've got to make something that you've not seen before and that you feel quite deeply. And that's why I loved your movie so much because I felt like I just, as I said in the beginning, I just, you know, see female friendships, like love, love, deep love, deep love affairs, very often. It, it, Most of my girlfriends, it's like the formative relationship of their life. Yeah. It's the biggest romance of their life often. Yeah. And yet it's like, there's less of an opportunity to be topless and therefore yes. people are less interested in, in making these films, I guess. It's true. I think, you know, I always think of, you know, the best films is almost like Trojan horse films that if you can lure people in with the promise of entertainment and leave them feeling something, then you've done something valuable. And your film did that so beautifully. And it's like the film itself is like its lead character. It lures you in with the promise of just, of, of beauty and sexuality and it's so enticing and just sparkly. And then it just wakes up and says like, 
hang on, I'm actually very sober and I'm going to tell you a fucking story. And I love that about it. I was like, oh, the movie is her. She is what we are all experiencing. And I, I think if we could find more ways to take topics that are very important to ingest and to unpack, and if we can allow for a bit of humor and allow for beauty and style and know that style doesn't detract from the significance of the topic, then we will have done something because we will bring people in and allow them to feel things and think about things. It, it's, it's so great to know that, you know, it's not necessary to like drag people through um, like meditations on grief and sadness and pain in order to make them consider these things. It's like, you can actually, you know, a, sugarcoat things and couch them and sandwich them in something enjoyable and I think then we bring more people in you know you talk about something like Ron Howard like those move big Hollywood movies that you want to get popcorn. like god I miss it so much but that's the thing like that you want I think is you want an experience you want to sit down you want to know that the person in charge who's showing you the film really gives a shit and yeah. it really wants to make this an experience for you yeah I I think rather than, so there are some movies that I feel like they deign to let you watch them. Yes. <laughs> like yes. this is going to be a misery, but it's also yeah. a masterpiece. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> Whereas How dare you suggest that it's not good because that means you don't care and you're not smart. And I think the idea of like taking away, like don't underestimate the intelligence of your audience and also uh, to understand that like they there can be a pop song that's just as heartbreaking as a ballad and it's like we can consume and understand human emotions in complex ways and i think audiences want that and as you're saying there's so much good content out there that it better be specific and it better be bold or else it's just not going to cut through the fabric it's just it's not going to it's not going to show up it's like you just go for it so i always tell when young filmmakers come to me and they're like what what do i do I just say like, keep it as personal as possible because that's the only way it's gonna feel specific. And I think you can do that with the script you write. I think you can also do that with one you didn't write, but it's like, then you really have to plug in and give yourself permission to own it and say, this movie is completely different the way I'm gonna do it than, than anyone else. It's like the famous story of Fellini used to say like, he didn't protect his scripts. He would, people would try to get at his scripts and he'd say, I'll send it to you, I'll send you everything you won't make my movie and I think about that all the time it's like if you really have your ideas locked in it's going to be uniquely yours and that's what will make it val valuable and also that the things you like are okay yeah people tell you what's good yes <laughs> yes there, there are pitfalls there obviously sometimes yeah. <laughs> means that there's gonna be stuff that's not so good but I think in general you know there's that thing of like, if you think it's fun and you think it's funny, like trust, trust Oh yourself. my God, that was such a huge lesson of mine. I mean, I cannot tell you how many people told me to take out the uh, animated Barbie, the stop motion Barbies out of Booksmart. And people were like, what the fuck is this? What is it? And I was like, I don't know, but it's my goddamn fantasy and I am keeping it in the movie and you can't take it away. And also people used to be so much more experimental. It's like even looking at movies from the fifties, a time when we think of everybody's being so repressed, movies were actually way more esoteric. There were fantasy sequences all over the place. There was animation on top of live action. People were going to really creative places. And then we were taught like, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. And I just think like, encouraging people like be bold make it weird make it yours like tarantino says make the movie only you can make and then just being unafraid of some people not loving it yeah. because if everybody likes it something's weird <laughs> although everyone loves your movie and i think they're right yeah.